Creator and loving God, we greet you this morning with the spirit of praise and thanksgiving. We're grateful, God, for how you have provided for us and showered your unending grace on us all week long. As we come on this day to share and study in your word and learn ways in which we can grow into becoming better disciples, we give you thanks for uh, the faithfulness of Dr. Carmichael Crutchfield and for his commitment to Christian education and formation. 
We thank you, God, for all those who work behind the scenes to make church school possible during COVID-19 and for all the participants in today's class. We pray, God, for our children, our seniors, healthcare workers, teachers, our leaders, first responders. And God, we pray for the world and for one another as we continue to battle the coronavirus pandemic. Now, God, we ask that you would prepare our hearts to listen, hear, and apply today's lesson in our lives and in our relationships with others. As we continue to wrestle with COVID-19, we're concerned, God, about what will happen in the days ahead. When will we be able to return to our jobs? When will children go back to school? When will we be able to gather with our family and our friends? When, Lord, will we be able to return to church? Today's lesson helps us to cope with our present situation and seek godly wisdom in response to our concerns. Above all things, God, we know that you are always present with us, caring for us, guiding us, and loving us as we strive to persevere through these difficult days. Increase our faith, O God, and help us as we maneuver through the challenges and obstacles ahead. We come this morning, Lord, with an attitude of gratitude for your faithfulness towards us, and we count every trial and temptation as an opportunity for joy. Now come, Holy Spirit, fill us with your wisdom and with your joy as we seek to follow and adhere to the teachings of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. From James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation. Because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Greetings. Welcome to Church School, August the 2nd, 2020. Today's lesson comes from James, the beginning of some lessons from James, uh, continuing our wisdom uh, theme, uh, James 1, 1 through 11. Uh, And the lesson titled, Ask For It, or you in your own quarterlies, you'll see faith and wisdom. I've sort of put it together, ask for it, faith and wisdom. People desire to be seen as wise. Uh, What is the source of wisdom? The question is raised. The letter of James affirms that God gives wisdom generously and ungrudgingly to those who ask in faith. The goals for today's learners and for us today is the cognizant goal is to consider the relationship between wisdom and perseverance through trials. Uh, Secondly, the effective goal is to affirm the value of trials and hardships in making one more wise and productive 
disciple. And third, the action we want to take away is to pray for godly wisdom by which to endure life's trials and temptations. So the lesson begins with a greeting from James, a slave, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes who are scattered outside the land of Israel. Greetings, James, there he is. Several mem members of people in the Bible in the New Testament are named James, but reliable tradition assigns this book to the one called James the Just, the half-brother of Jesus and, and the brother of Jude who led the church in Jerusalem. Knowing that this Jesus was the half-brother of Jesus makes his self-introduction all more the more significant. He did not proclaim himself the brother of Jesus, but only a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was more than James' brother. More importantly, Jesus was his Lord, a bondservant or slave, depending on what version of the Bible you look at, is an important word. It translates the, it translates the ancient Greek word doulos, and is better, probably better simply translated as slave, a slave, one who has permanent relationship of servitude to another. Among the Greeks, with a strong sense of personal freedom, the term slave carried a degrading condemnation, condemnation, connotation, I should say. Lord is also an important word. It translates the, the ancient Greek word kurios. It simply meant the master of a doulos, the master of a slave. And in the context, it means Jacob, James considered Jesus God. What, G, what James meant by the reference to the 12 tribes is difficult to understand. The question is whether James wrote a letter to only Christians from a Jewish background or to all Christians. Certainly this letter applies to all Christians, yet James probably wrote his letter before Gentiles were brought into the church at least before Gentile Christians appeared in any significant number. The 12 tribes, as referred to in this verse, is a Jewish figure of speech that sometimes refers to the Jewish people as a whole. At this time, the Jewish people were scattered all over the world, and there was a Christian, there was a Christian presence among most Jewish communities throughout the world. Regarding the extent of the dispersion, Josephus wrote, there is no city, no tribe, whether Greek or barbarian, in which Jewish law and Jewish customs have not taken root. Since this was written for the body of Christians and existed at that time, this is also a letter for us today. Greetings, James says. The salutation, greetings, was the customary Greek way of opening a letter. Paul never used it. He, he referred to salute his readers with the words grace and peace. Here James used this great customary salutation, greetings. And then in verses 2 through 4, uh, it reads, my brothers and sisters, think of the various tests you encounter as occasions for joy. After all, you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let this endurance complete its work so that you may be fully mature, complete, and lacking in nothing. James regarded trials as inevitable. He said that when not, if you fall into various trials, at the same time, trials are occasions for joy, not discouragement or resignation. We can count it all joy in the midst of trials because they are used to produce patience. The older King James Version says, when ye fall into divers temptations, but the rendering here, trials, is preferred. The word translated trials signifies affliction, persecution, or trial of any kind. And in this sense, it is used here not intending diabolic suggestion or what is generally understood by the word temptation. When you fall into it, not going step by step, or, but are precipitated or plunged. When ye are so surrounded that there is no escaping then, being distressed as David was in Psalm 116. Patience is the ancient Greek word, hupomene. This word does not describe a passive waiting, but an active endurance. 
It isn't so much the quality that helps you sit quietly in the doctor's waiting room as it is the quality that helps you finish a marathon. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Faith is tested through trials, not produced by trials. Trials reveal what faith we can do have, not because God doesn't know how much faith we have, but so that our faith will be evident to ourselves and to those around us. We notice that it is faith that is tested and it shows that faith is important and precious because only precious things are tested so thoroughly. Faith is as vital to salvation as the heart is vital to the body. Hence the javelins of the enemy are mainly aimed at this essential grace of patience and faith. James did not want anyone to think that God sends trials to break down or destroy our faith. Therefore, he will come back to this point in James later outside of this particular text. But he does say this faith produces patience. Trials, trials I should say, don't produce faith but produce patience. When trials are received with faith, it produces patience, yet patience is not inevitably produced in times of trial. In, if difficulties are received in unbelief and grumbling, trials can produce bitterness and discouragement. This is why James exhorted us to count it all joy. Counting it all joy is faith's response to a time of trial. How to receive this wisdom you need from God? That's what we find in verses 5 through 8. But anyone who needs wisdom should ask God, whose very nature is to give to everyone without a second thought, without keeping score. Wisdom will certainly be given to those who ask. Whoever asks shouldn't hesitate. They should ask in faith without doubting. Whoever doubts like the surf of the sea tossed and turned in the wind, people like that should never imagine that they will receive anything from the Lord. They are double-minded, unstable in all their ways. See what James is saying, trials bring a necessary season to seek wisdom from God. We often don't know we need wisdom until our time is of difficulty. Once in a time of trial, we need to know if a particular trial is something God wants us to eliminate by faith or persevere in it with faith, by faith. This requires wisdom. In trials, we need wisdom, a lot more than we need knowledge. Knowledge is raw information, but wisdom knows the how to use knowledge. Someone once said that knowledge is the ability to take things apart, but wisdom is the ability to put things together. To receive wisdom, we simply ask of God, who gives wisdom generously, liberally, and without despising our requests, without reproach, we are also ready to go to the books, to go to people, to go to ceremony, to anything except to God. Consequently, the text does not say, let the person ask books, nor ask priests, but let the person ask of God. God does indeed give liberally. God gives according to God's excellent greatness, knowing God's generosity, that God never despises or resents us for asking for wisdom, should encourage us to ask God often. We understand that God is the God of the open hand, not the God of the clenched fist. When we want wisdom, the place to begin and an end is the Bible. True wisdom will always be consistent with God's word. The language here implies humility in coming to God. It does not say, let us buy of God, let us demand of God, let us earn from God. Oh no, let us ask of God. It is the beggar's word. Our request for wisdom must be made like any other request, in faith, without doubting God's ability or desire to give us this wisdom. We notice that not only must we come in faith, but one must also ask in faith. And this is where the prayers of many fail. The one who doubts and lacks faith should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. This lack of faith and trust in God also shows that we have, not, we have no foundation being unstable in all of our ways. To ask, but to ask God. 
in a doubting way shows that we are double-minded. If we had no faith, we would never ask at all. If we had no unbelief, we should have no doubting. To be in the middle ground, <coughs> excuse me, between faith and unbelief is to be double-minded. Do you believe that God can give you wisdom and that he will do so if you ask God? Then go at once to God and say, Lord, this is what I need. Specify your wants. Then state your exact condition. Lay the whole case before God with as much orderliness as you were telling your story and to an intelligent friend who was willing to hear it and prepared to help you. Then say, Lord, this is specifically what I think I want. And I ask this of the believing that thou canst give it, can give it to us. And then, in these last three verses, James says, as much as is appropriate for the poor to rejoice when they are lifted up by God, so it is appropriate, but far more difficult for the wealthy to rejoice when they are brought to humiliation by trials. In the land of Israel, there are many kinds of beautiful flowers that spring to light when the rains come, but they last for only a short time before withering away. On the scale of, of eternity, this is how quickly the rich man, a rich person, also will fade away in his or her pursuits. The riches of this world will certainly fade away, but James says the rich man will fade away if we put our life and our identity into things that fade away and will fade, that will also fade away. How much better to put our life and our identity in things that will never fade. If a person is only rich in this world, when he dies, he or she leaves their riches. But if a person is rich before God, when he or she dies, he or she goes to his or her riches. That's a good word for us today. Well, I have three challenges for us today as I end this lesson. Make a list of qualities or characteristics that typify the person who has the kind of wisdom James is talking about. Identify a quality from this list that you would like to strengthen in your own self. Number two, reflect upon some past experience with trials and hardships and how those make you wiser and more productive in your discipleship. And then lastly, this is a very active thing for us to do. Ask, write a prayer asking God for godly wisdom. That is the end of our lesson today. Ask for it. Faith and wisdom. God bless you.